What's up, Facebook Live? Thanks for joining us for our third installment of the Southern Four Wheel Drive TechNet series. So this week we're going to be talking about off-road suspensions. Um, we are here hosted by Clemson Four Wheel Drive Center. Last week on our second Facebook Live TechNet, uh, TechNet session with Southern Four Wheel Drive Association, we talked about recovery gear and rigging basics kind of 101. At the peak, we had 72 people watching us, and after 24 hours, over 2,500 people have viewed this video. What that means is on this video, we've got to surpass that. So go ahead, smash that like button, hit that share button, tell your mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, brother, sister, hairdresser, whoever you got to tell, get them to watch the video and share Southern Four Wheel Drive. So Southern Four Wheel Drive is continuing their education, conservation, and recreation movement, their key principles that they're following. What, uh, what we'd like for you guys to do is visit their webpage, www.sfwda.org. Okay, so go ahead, go to their webpage, check it out. Tons of great information, and you can learn about future events that are coming out. So this evening, we've got a couple of different guests from Clemson Four Wheel Drive, Cole Connor, their lead tech and fabrication specialist is going to take us in the back and show us a little bit um, about the underside of some JKs and JLUs while we're under there. And we're going to talk about pieces and parts so that you can learn uh, kind of how different pieces work together, what their function is, and as you guys voted, we're going to talk about bump stops as well and when to upgrade them, when to replace them. So, a couple of things before we get started and go back there though questions tonight so post your questions in the comments preface it with a Q so that we know that it's a question but we're not going to answer them as the video goes through we're going to wait until the end and do a Q&A session with, with, with Cole in the back after that let's talk about what everybody's here for the giveaways right two giveaways to work on one our weekly giveaway I want everyone to put down in the comments hello everyone I am from or sorry hello everyone I am your name and then enter where you're from your city and state that will enter you to win a Jayco elite tire gauge right got to have a tire gauge off-road your air and tires down you want to make sure you air them back up to the right PSI so that we don't have an issue on the road like a tire blowout um, or the regular tire wear while we're out there the next one is and this is the big one right the BFG tires Tonight's key phrase that you have to put in is thank you BFG into the comments. This enters you, enters you to win five BFG tires, right? Gives you that opportunity to win. We're gonna do the drawing for these at Dixie Run this year. So you can have the opportunity to have your name in the hat several times if you continue to keep con commenting on these TechNet series, but you gotta watch the video to know what the phrase is. Cool thing is, don't have to be present at Dixie Run in order to win, right? We're just going to do the drawing there because that's going to be our big event for this year. All right. So thank you, BFG. Also for the Jayco Elite Tire Gauge, put hello everyone, I am your name and then your city and state that you're from. Now a little bit of business for Southern. We all know this pandemic, the COVID-19, Nobody expected this to happen, right? There's been a lot of things that uh, have changed because of that. Southern Four Wheel Drive is the association gets its money from two major events every year. That's Trail Fest and Dixie Run. That money or those funds are what goes to being able to help you and give grants to you and your organizations and also to help them fight for land usage rights, continue these educational series, and focus on conservation and recreation. So those funds are incredibly important to Southern. With losing Trail Fest, that took away a major portion of the funds that Southern typically brings in. So we need your help right now. Opportunity for you again to get your name in the hat to win the BFG set of tires. We urge you to go to www.sfwda.org and become a member of Southern Four Wheel Drive. By becoming a member, and joining those funds go into the account and they go back to help us fight to keep lands open and continue these educational series 
Super important, guys. So go ahead and do that. Tell your friends, your buddies. If you're a member of a club, convince your club to do that as well. Not only does that bring funds to Southern, but also it unites us with one voice, right? All those names gives us the ability to take those uh, names when we go somewhere and we say, hey, all these people are in the off-road community and they want to use these lands. Super important. So go ahead and go join again. Last time, www.sfwda.org um, and go to memberships. All right, so now, without further ado, we're gonna introduce Roger, the manager of Clemson Four Wheel Drive Center here, and he's gonna tell us a little bit about Clemson Four Wheel Drive, how they got started, and how long they've been around. Thank you, Mike. I'm Roger Dalrymple with Clemson Four Wheel Center. We're a four wheel drive off-road shop uh, here just outside Clemson, South Carolina. This is our 50th year in business. Um, Fred Ferry, my father-in-law, uh, started uh, business here in town in 1970. I moved to this location in 1978 and, uh, and has built uh, uh, a catalog business and uh, uh, online sales business in addition to a uh, local shop and uh, working on general maintenance to wielding rigs for the ultimate adventure right here in our shop uh, over the years. And uh, so, uh, so we kind of specialize in, uh, in Jeep uh, for the most part, probably 50% or maybe a little more of the vehicles we work on are Jeep. And most of the rest is a split of Ford, Chevy, Toyota, uh, Ram. And uh, so, but we do pretty much anything uh, general maintenance wise and uh, we do a lot of suspension and a lot of driveline. Uh, manual transmission and transfer case repairs, differential repairs, gear swaps, uh, custom suspension work, fabrication work uh, on suspensions. So uh, we do all of that kind of stuff here as well as general, uh, we install trailer hitches for, for your family car if that's what you need. So we have a pretty diverse uh, uh, shop here that we can do a lot of different things in. We're a warehouse distributor for several of the major uh, brands in the uh, off-road industry, uh, Warren Winch, uh, Best Stop, uh, JKS and, and BDS suspension, Rough Country suspension. We do a lot of different suspensions. Um, uh, Kentrol, uh, Daystar, you may be able to see some product in the background. We're actually a distributor for SunX Tools as well. And uh, we're a uh, warranty service center for Warren Winch. So uh, if uh, in, the, in the rare case that you do need service or repair for your winch or you need parts, uh, we have parts on the shelf. We have full service, uh, pretty much anything. If it's worn, we can fix it or, or, uh, or get you parts for, to fix it yourself. Best Stop and Warren and some of those lines are, are standards that uh, stay and stay and stay. Yeah, so 50 years, right? That's awesome for as far as uh, the length of time the shop's been running. So it definitely speaks to their quality work as well as their uh, customer service, right? So, Roger, tell us a little bit, what got you into kind of the off-road world? Well, um, I married into it, actually. I, I've uh, uh, worked in automotive-related fields uh, all of my working life. Uh, started out in uh, uh, turning wrenches and I went from there to traditional auto parts. And uh, so, but as a result of fooling with race cars, circle track cars, uh, Fred Perry that owns Clemson Four Wheel Center uh, had a circle track car and I helped a friend of mine who had one. And so we got to be friends at the racetrack. And then along comes Fred's daughter and the rest is history. And uh, so uh, Renee and I have been married for 30 years now and uh, I've been working here that entire time. Awesome, yeah. So um, behind us here, you notice we've got a stripped down frame uh, with some pieces and components going back together. Pretty cool project you guys got going on. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's a, a scrambler that Fred bought uh, maybe 10 years or so ago and kind of began a restoration on, had the tub painted and uh, and fixed and uh, and then it, it got kind of pushed aside for a while and uh, it just sat in uh, in our other building here on the property for several years and so we finally decided to do a showroom build we decided that we'd take this thing down to the bare frame have the frame sandblasted and powder coated bring it right into our showroom and build a brand new scrambler right here in the showroom 
So right now we have the, the frame, we have the, uh, you can see the springs, uh, and uh, we're just pulling together the stuff to start building, setting in the, the drive line into the chassis. The axles have been rebuilt, re-geared to 373, I believe is what we chose. Uh, the transfer case has been rebuilt, the transmission, it's an automatic, it's been rebuilt. Uh, we just got the long block back from the engine builder yesterday and are uh, ready to start putting intake manifolds and so forth on that. Then the plan is to sit all that in the chassis and I'll uh, get the plumbing done on the chassis and set the body on there and start finishing it up. And uh, so it's kind of a social media build. We're, we're going to try to document all this and uh, uh, post images along the way on our uh, uh, Instagram page. Awesome. So some super cool stuff going on here at Clemson Four Wheel Drive Center. Make sure all you people watching now that you follow their Facebook page, their Instagram page, check them out online. Go ahead and give them a review. Thank them for giving us the time and opportunity to come down here uh, and do our TechNet session. Keep your eyes on this scrambler build, right? Perfect time with the Gladiator kind of hitting its, its stride. We can see this, the scrambler coming back to life here as well. So we're gonna head in the back now and join up with Cole and learn about some off-road suspension basics. Hi, I'm Cole Connor from Clemson Four Wheel, uh, lead tech and fabricator. Today uh, we'll be discussing some bump stops. This is on a pretty new JL Rubicon Unlimited. Uh, this one has a basic two and a half kit uh, from the sky gunner. So it consists of bump stops front and rear, sway bar links, springs, shocks. They're just awesome. So um, I'm joining a little late here as we move into the back, but we do have Cole right here. Cole is the lead tech here at Clemson. Tons of uh, experience working on Jeeps. And we're gonna talk a little bit uh, about the different pieces and parts that we see underneath. You guys joined in on the poll and voted for what you wanted to hear about. And surprisingly enough, bump stops were on the top of the list. So that's gonna be our main focus, but we do have roughly again about an hour here. So we've got some time to really delve into this. Uh, the pieces and parts really learn some of the correct terminology and what it means, as well as you guys can throw your questions up. And as long as it's not going to take forever for us to answer it and get too in depth, we're going to continue on. So I'm going to pass things over to Cole here. And first, we're going to start talking about bump stops. So obviously, as you lift the vehicle, the main goal is to get bigger tires on it. Bigger tires roll over things easier. But to be able to cycle those tires and have maximum traction, you also need to make sure that you clear your fenders. And as you can see, this is a brand new JL. You don't want to go off road and, you know, say you bought a cheaper kit with no bump stop. As soon as you go off road, it, when it cycles, it's going to rub the fender. So the other end, you have a spacer in there, essentially. So you can go. This is more of the cheaper route. Um, it's like a polyurethane spacer that makes this dimension smaller. There's less travel there. So with the bump stops here, we've got the one on top here. What's kind of the difference in the, in the two pieces and parts? Do you ever go to replace this one up top? So once again, there's many different options. You, it all begins on just like with a little bit. We can go as crazy as keeping that, or we can go crazy and put a hydraulic bump up there. And you'll cut that off, and then it's got a kit that goes in there, and it's uh, air over hydraulic. So you could set that up as like a two inch travel or four inch travel. So and what that does is slow down the compression and start pushing back and ease your ride. So when I'm going on the trail, maybe I'm, I hit a ditch or something pretty quick. And as this flexes up with this one, I'm going to get what, like a more jarring hit to it, to me? More of a jar. Yeah. And that's, that's more of your high speed situations, you know, and your air bumps are more towards high speed and you're going to go to bombs and fields or the desert, you know, but. You're just gonna do some slow crawling, you know, just backwoods trails and stuff. These are perfectly fine as long as you have good up travel from ride height. This is where a lot of people go wrong is you'll be one inch up travel just sitting there without even going off road. And then that's where these are pretty abusive. Pretty abusive. So with these older vehicles, do I have to worry about this as a maintenance item? Um not more, you know, more or less, it's, it's a very old one. These actually break and fall out, um, and they actually, you know, crumple in a bunch of different pieces. So, but you can get replacement of those in the factory style, or you can get a polyurethane, 
which will hold up longer, but it's also a little harsher than the factory foam. Okay. So does it hold up better, like in mud and stuff like that? Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Now, so this one's the kind of the soft, and this just limits the flex up. Yeah, you're just pretty much taking a stock dimension and moving it up to compensate for the bigger tires. Very cool. Now, if I wanted more flex, just take the foam stops out, right? Not essentially. Your flex really is determined by the shocks, but you don't want to go too long in the shocks. You want to have a happy medium and also keep keep drive line angles and everything right, and not overextend U joints and so forth. Uh, you get too long of your shock on it, it'll droop out here. You know, this is more of like a progressive coil. So if you don't have a progressive coil, these will actually sag down. If they sag down too far, they'll actually fall out. So if you, if you go real fast and one drops out, and you come, you know, once that spring's out, then you're sitting on the bump stop with no suspension. Well, that's a bad bet. Wow. Um, so while bump stops limit, ultimately, I'm guessing, are up travel, what limits are down travel? So on most Jeeps, you know, if you're just trail riding, once again, it's not really essential, but if you want to get, you know, do proper beyond, proper suspension, you want to have bump stops and limit straps. When you invest in shocks, you don't want them sitting on the, on the seal. Not all shocks are really designed for that. So, what I have here is a limit strap that you can add. Uh, that's a 4130 chromoly hands on it. You know, I think that's a quad wrap. So, you can come in here and add some tabs. And, you know, this is an ideal, obviously. You add that, and it'll keep from drooping too far if you have too long of a shock or if you want to save your shocks. So you would ultimately connect one end of this to your frame and another end to, I'm guessing, your axle? Yep. Like add a control arm or something along yeah, like that? control arm bolt, or if you want to add a tab, you can put a double sheer tab on the tube, weld it in. Uh, you know, start losing a little bit of room, so it gets a little difficult. Like this Jeep has ABS wires on it and the brake line and the e-locker and the vent tube on this side so it gets very compact yeah that's a lot going on with a lot going on under there so limit straps will limit our, our down travel bump stops limit our up travel there are different levels but i'm guessing with limit straps pretty much anything's a limit strap for the most part i mean it seems pretty much like it's just a seat belt ultimately essentially they use higher higher quality and you also have multiple layers of it so and most of your own straps if you buy high quality one are meant for people that are jumping it so it's coming down and snacking them this quick so for what we're doing most of the time you know any of those are going to be a good quality one for you awesome so based on what cole said right limit our up travel with proper bump stops so our tires don't go up into our fenders uh, we don't want to tear our fenders off our beautiful new vehicles right we love them uh, to limit down travel so we don't start popping coils out or overstressing our shock seals, a good limit strap is a good op option to do that. Um, and obviously with the Jeeps and the way they make them now and the amount of flex they have, you put a lift on it and you start getting really flexy, these might be an option for you. Now, Cole, so we've talked a little bit about bump stops, down travel. We've hit briefly on springs, but they're not all springs are the same, right? Coil springs? Right, yeah, there, there's actually quite a few different ones you can get these days. So this is more of a progressive. So it's, it's kind of a dual rate, but not quite. It's, uh, it's a lot softer, and you see how you can pull on it easy? The spring rate itself is determined by the diameter of the coil and unsprung. And then the dual rate, it'll be a bunch of these collapsed together, and then when it droops out, the coil will be 22 inches or so, but under, you know, ride height, it'll be maybe 12. So a lot of travel in the spring itself. Or you can go to your traditional, just a regular wrap spring, and it's equal gaps the whole way. Right. Where where would be a situation I'd choose one over the other? Um, normally, I'm guessing Jeeps just come with like a standard spring where the coils are all the same distance apart. Yeah, essentially. The uh, aftermarket world right now, everyone's going to the progressive and dual rate just because you can put such a longer shock on it and get that travel without coil unseating. So once again, you don't want your coil falling out. But the uh, the JLs and some of the newer Jeeps, they flex so well now that they can throw more travel at them with stock geometry without having to go and put a long arm kit on them right away. Wow. Wow. So. Now we've talked about springs. Tell us a little bit about different shocks, man. The shock world is crazy. 
and you see the differences. There's, you know, you can go up to King and you got fifteen hundred dollars a shock and you know eighteen hundred dollars a shock, or I can go down to Advance and buy a twenty-five dollar shock. What's kind of the differences in that world? Well, a lot of the stuff's going to determine obviously brand, and also the biggest thing on most of the shocks is a budget. You know, what is your budget? What are you doing? You know, if you're not jumping all the time, high speed, I wouldn't say I wouldn't steer you away from King and like Fox. Fox and King are definitely very good shocks and valve well, but I wouldn't go by the top of the line ones right off the bat. You know, it depends on what you're doing, and also some of those are set up for like seven inch up travel and down travel. So if you're running around on a low vehicle, you don't, you know, you're not going to go fast. You don't have to do the high reservoirs and all that and the bigger diameter. But a lot of those companies are making it more affordable. Like I believe Fox has the uh, Adventure series now. Yeah. And those are very good shock for valving that they've done some research on them and have them fine tuned, so they ride really well. Um, you can go with reservoir without reservoir. And what's the benefits of one over the other? The reservoir separates the liquid over the gas, basically. And you know, everyone thinks it's a cooling thing, but I don't think it's as big a deal for the cooling. You know, most of the cooling ones they'll have fins on and you know so forth to help kind of dissipate that heat. Yes. So as our shocks kind of go in and out, especially when we get at high speeds, right? Say you're on a gravel road, you've got some washboards, you're driving over it, and the shock compresses and, and rebounds back out. They tend to, the fluid in there cavitates, they build up heat, and the shock performance actually degrades over time. So that's where we start getting into the difference to higher end shocks versus lower end shocks. And there's other things as far as up travel and down travel. So that's kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about heat and remote reservoirs and things like that and when we should choose one or the other. But if I'm just kind of a beginner and I'm just looking to put a bigger tire on, go to URI or Windrock Park or something like that and do some rock crawling, do I really need to invest in you know remote reservoir coilovers and all that? If you're going to be doing more of the slow speed crawling, like the stuff you're going to do at URI, you know, there's not really any high speed sections there. Per se, yeah, you, you some people make, think it is you right. Some high speed sections, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't. I would focus on you know. There's other other videos will be done throughout the week, and all these for a beginner all add up. So I wouldn't go blow your whole budget on a pair of shocks that you're not really going to see the potential of them. So yeah, yeah, very good. So now we've talked a little bit about shocks. The next question I'm going to pose to Cole, and this is one. Man, it's debatable in the off-road world, especially some of you old-school Jeep people. Um, you say just throw it away and take it off, but kind of get cold to explain to us a little bit about the sway bar, what's important about it, and why do we disconnect it? So a sway bar is definitely a, a debatable thing. Um, once again, uh, you can go as cheap as you want or more expensive options, but a sway bar is definitely a must if you, like where we live, really near the Blue Ridge Mountains, you're going to go mountain riding and you've never driven a Jeep without a sway bar, take it off and go drive it and see what it's like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's if you want to drive it with a family in the back and all that, I, I highly recommend trying to leave one. Uh, like on this Jeep, this has got a disconnect, so you don't even have to get out and unhook these anymore. This is just a longer one, so when it droops out, it doesn't invert. So the bar itself, as you go down the road and the axle twists, this bar twists with it keeps it from the body roll. So it definitely helps more road manners. Uh, the debatable side of it is, if you have a rock crawler, do you keep the sway bars, do you not? Well, that all determines on your geometry and everything and how the Jeep acts when you get on something. Does it unload a sway bar, like a, a torsion style, like for example, a Curry anti rock that's got a torsion style, that'll actually keep it from trying to unload sometimes, but you may have something else going on, so that's not always yeah. So sway bar on or off, right? If you're going to be taking long trips, especially windy roads, things like that, you want to limit that body roll. Okay. So that way when you go around a corner, that whole body isn't leaning away from the, where the suspension is because it's tied basically if unsprung weight to sprung weight, right? Essentially. Yes. Essentially. Very cool. Now you had mentioned that longer lengths and not inverting. Uh, so when I lift, how far can I lift my Jeep before I need longer lengths? Honestly, that's all determined once again on shocks. 
I mean, how much travel you have. Um, most of your kits, I would highly recommend making sure you replace them. On the JKs and JLs specifically, these things are only like this long factory, so it doesn't have much pivot. And basically, you want it to be longer for the pivot, so this doesn't swing down as quick. So. And that'll keep it from basically popping out. Yep, and when it pops this way and you come back down, it'll actually wrap this way and sometimes break the other link. Because that bar only twists so much. So Now, this one's a Rubicon, and it's got electronic disconnecting sway bar. So we can push a button, it unlocks. Uh, to my understanding with the Rubicon, I can really only do that in four-wheel load, right? In the stock configuration, yes, but a lot of aftermarket companies tuners now. Um, there's so many now I can't even name them all. But you can go in there and program that where you can turn it off and on whenever you want. So. Sweet. So now if I don't have a Rubicon, I didn't spring for that, yep. what are kind of manual disconnecting sway bars? So it'll have a, basically it'll do a cutaway here and there'll be a pin through there. Or, so there'll be two pins in some scenarios and then some on this bolt it'll slide on and off. It depends on the brand. And some actually come all the way off, you store them in the vehicle, and then others will actually have a, a bracket up here that you you actually swing the bar up here and, and pin it away so it's out of the way. So if, if, why would I really want to off-road disconnect my sway bar anyway? I mean, is it is it doing anything for me off-road? That's a good question. The stock sway bar is so stiff, especially the front ones. You know, the rears aren't as bad. They're actually half the diameter of this or, or smaller than that. So this bar is so stiff that it actually won't let the vehicle flex and you're not getting optimal travel. And as we all know, the more travel you have and the more you keep that tire on the ground as you go through an obstacle, the more traction and the further you go up. Yeah, yeah. So keeping those tires on the ground, disconnect the sway bar can help with that. That way we don't get a tire to come up off the ground, differentials sending power to the path least resistance, it's gonna to send to that tire off the ground and we're gonna induce tire spin, right? So it's all about keeping good tire contact. That's why you need BFGs, right? All right, so kind of explain to me, I'm, I come from an IFS world, independent front suspension, so a little out of my element looking at uh, this solid axle here. Talk to me a little bit about the steering linkage, kind of the path that it follows through on here. Uh, starting with you know, I understand kind of our steering box here, but everything else, what, what have we got going on? All right, so obviously your, your steering wheel is connected to your steering box. And then from there, you can't quite see it, but the pitman arm is right there. Some kits have a drop, some don't, depending on the lid. Then you have a drag link, which comes down and connects normally to the knuckle. Sometimes it connects to the tie rod, different configurations. But then you have the tie rod that keeps both, both in track with each other. And the tie rod is normally the most vulnerable because it's the lowest. And this one actually has a Synergy uh, 4130 Chromoly tie rod on it with bigger tie rod ends. And it's actually painted over again now, but it's taking quite a use and comes back straight every time. So you can beat that tie rod up against rocks and it's going to hang tight. Yep. So basically when I steer and I turn my steering wheel, I'm really only moving one tire. The tie rod's what moves the other tire along with it? More or less it follows. Follows. Okay, so if I bent this, say a, a stock one, that's when we kind of get the pigeon toe tires yep. where they're pointing in? Yep, if you, if you bend this, it always toes in. So, and then you have bad alignment, and then like on a Jeep, you'll get death wobble with the toe being off. So this is where it's a, a key factor to upgrade. A key factor, yeah. But if I get death wobble, I just put a steering stabilizer on it, right? Okay. Not quite. Now, you know, depending on if your tires are balanced and all, that's that's a whole other debate on, <laughs> on death wobble. But, you know, a steering stabilizer does help. It is a damper. Um, some say it's not necessary. Some do. It does help a little bit, but most of the time you have another factor that's going wrong. Yeah, so more or less it's just dampening whatever the problem is. Correct. Right? You hear that, Facebook world? <laughs> steering stabilizers don't. Fix your death wobble, it just hides it. So, um, steering stabilizers, is there, and we kind of talked about the upgrades for the steering linkage, but is there upgrades for steering stabilizers? There are, the, uh, the factory ones, normally the valving's not real heavy in it, so a lot of your aftermarket ones will have a heavier valve in it. 
So, and we do on most stock heaps, stock tie rods, uh, stock drag links, you know, they, especially some with some miles, they get a little play, or, or the box itself, the sector shaft has just a little bit of play, that'll cause it, but the biggest thing is bigger tires, not keeping up with maintenance, and you know, not everybody wants to get their balance, their tires balanced every time they go out. So I understand that. So that's where we throw one of those on, and it just helps you get back home to do the maintenance. Yeah, awesome. Now, is that something that I kind of um, any type of maintenance on, as far as any of the steering linkage we talked about? What do I need to look at as far as maintenance on those items? So obviously, the factory tie rod ends are not greasable on almost any vehicle these days. If you find one, I'm surprised. <laughs> but everything that you do aftermarket these days, if you look right here, this one has a grease fitting. So you do want to keep it greased, but at the same time, a lot of people make this mistake. Don't over grease. When you over grease, you rip the boot. So then what do you do when you hit dirt roads? It attracts all the dirt in there and sticks. Then gets in the joint, where's the joint out? So that's the main thing. Another thing is you if you do get the most heavy duty, you know, biggest tire rod you can, you still would like to keep an eye on the toe. Keep, you know, keep eyes if it's getting hit, if you're off-roading. Because when the toe changes, even if you don't have death wall on. Well, now you just wore your tires up, you have a half inch to an inch toe in. So, if, if my vehicle is towed in a little bit, can I tell that just by looking at the tires as far as wear? If you look at the wear, yes. It'll have, depending on if it's toe in or toe out, outside or inside wear. But if you have any type of wear, I highly recommend bringing it in somewhere, get it checked over. Like, we do, uh, most time it's free to put it on the lift and check it over real quick. Uh, at the worst case, 40 bucks, have it checked out. I mean, that's that's worth a set of tires to keep them alive to me. I don't know about you. Yeah, 40 bucks to keep a set of tires from wearing out. When you start getting up into 35s and 37s, I mean, we're talking big money for those tires. So 40 bucks to make sure that they're not wearing kind of fun and funky uh, is super important. So uh, at what point time would I want to look to replace my tie rod ends? Uh, so it's all wear and tear obviously so right. if you're not wheeling it often or just in dirt roads they're probably going to live a lot longer especially the heavier duty ones. Now if you're going off road all the time honestly every time I go out I check all of mine. I have time so I check all my bolts and everything. It should be good practice if you're wheeling your stuff hard to go over each time. But the biggest thing, the easiest way for someone to check it out is have one, have someone shake the wheel for you, whether it's running or not, and while they're shaking it, look under it and see if you can see anything moving around. You know, if this is moving around separate from this, no, not just twisting, but if it's rocking, popping, or anything, that's a problem. Or if you see this nut loose, you know, you could be walling out this knuckle and cost you a lot of money. Okay, so. Just a back and forth with the steering wheel, look for movement in your steering linkage. That way we can you can kind of tell uh, if you've got an issue. So if you've got kids throwing up there, let them wiggle the steering wheel and take a look at it. Um, we always, with uh, Morrison Outdoor Adventures in our training classes, we always start them off with a vehicle 360 where it's a pre-check before you hit the trails or before you go on a long trip, right? Add that to your pre-check just to make sure you're keeping an eye on those and your post-trip check. Now, so we've gone through kind of steering, and we talked about sway bars, springs, bump stops, all that. Tying your axle to your frame in a solid configuration with two joints, which sees a lot of force going down the road, pinballing it up an obstacle, anything like that. So uh, when you get a lift, it needs to be corrected with a longer one or one that has a raised bracket. Um, if you're willing it really hard, I would, you know, this one gets driven mostly. Um, I would recommend getting the heavier one. These stock ones are really, really thin. So, and it's actually just, you know, print in a tube. Ugh. So, I like to see a heavier duty one go on that's getting wheeled a lot. So, especially once you upgrade, maybe are there lift kits out there that come with those yes, already? Yeah, there's plenty of lift kits that come with forged ones now. The old piece of forged and has a bushing or heim in it. Um, and that's still something you'll keep eye on. Bushings do wear, you know, especially if you've got a lot of travel. If you got bushings in there, it's going to rip the bushing as it cycles constantly. Now, if you've got a lot of travel, I recommend Hines, just because they can freeze spin in the Hine and don't bind. But you do get a little more feedback, so there's there's another debate for you, Hines versus bushings. Yeah, yeah. so Hines, I'm guessing, less maintenance with them. 
Right. You stay last longer. longer. Yeah, you still want to check them once again. You know, Jana's come loose. That's even on the tie rods. You want to check those. Uh, the hind itself, the inside the ball and the Teflon, the Teflon wears out, starts getting some play. Another cause of death wobble. Track bar is a big thing for death wobble. Awesome. Now, where it could, I noticed kind of where it's connected to the axle looks pretty sturdy, but where it's connected to the frame, maybe it's hung down, looks like it could get some leverage. Should I ever upgrade that? I've heard tail kind of, of where those have been torn off of. Yeah, believe it or not, in all my years, I have not seen that many ripped off. I've seen a lot of friends and stuff been on the trail and they rip off, but I've only seen, I think, a couple of them. They're mostly ripped off down here. And they have this, the stock brackets are thin, but a lot of companies are making brackets so you can weld in place, stiff them up. I know Synergy is one that makes a tie-in bracket from the pitman arm to the frame and stiffens the uh, track bar bracket all in one. So that's a that's a big upgrade. So I'm guessing you know if I'm gonna run like 37 inch tires, that's a good one to do. Yeah, definitely. Especially if you know if you're gonna go out there and send it up a couple of hospitals, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you, wanna, you wanna have some insurance on there for you. So yeah. So one of the big things to think about as you're upgrading your vehicle, right? So your vehicle comes to you stock. It's got you know 33 to 35 inch tires on it. Um, that's what the engineer designed it to kind of fit around. Now, we can't leave anything alone, right, in the off-road world, so we start modifying it, it goes to a bigger tire, 37. Not only now do we have a whole lot more rotational mass, but there's a whole lot more leverage, because as this tire is rotating, a smaller tire doesn't have a whole lot of force when it hits the ground. You get a bigger tire, it's just like adding, you know, a cheater bar when you're trying to break a bolt loose. So all that transfers to all these mechanics we're talking about underneath here. So, Cole, tell me a little bit about, you mentioned kind of the four length control arms, right? Yeah. And tell me a little bit about the difference between long arm versus short arm too. So, uh, if you want to step over here, we can look at a, a long arm G2. So, visuals are definitely the best for anyone. So, this is a long arm G2. It has a very long, it's, I think it's around 40 inches, 38, 40 inches long from bolt to bolt. And on the stock Jeep, it's maybe about 20 inches. So, when they say long arm, Control arms literally get longer, and as you do that, it's, it's the geometry gets better as it droops out. It's no different than my arm here doing that versus this. So this pivot is the axle. It doesn't drop below the body as quick if you have a lot of travel having uh, long arms versus short arms. But you know that's that's a big upgrade. You know, big expense. So depends on your budget once again. Everything comes down to the budget. <laughs> Everything comes down to money, right? Yes. So. When I'm on the road, how does long arm or short arm do affect me? Does it really have much difference on the road? Honestly, if you have a more lifted, like let's go back a couple years and go with like this LJ. This LJ had a around a 15, 16 inch arm on it. So the pivot was way back here. So say we lift this deep three, four inches. Well, that arm's already at an angle like this, or I guess in reality that way. But that's already sitting there, so as it travels, it, it doesn't move real far. And with the long arm, it moves further, once again, like I was explaining. So the ride quality gets better because the axle is not moving forward and back as much. Okay. Now, we've, we've kind of come over here and taken a look at this Jeep. Um, there's some significance to this Jeep, right? Yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a, a little leap into the off road world. <laughs> yeah. Now, earlier you mentioned. Um, about a Curry Anorox sway bar. Yep. So this has one of those, right? Yep, it's right back here on this. The, the bar, do you remember how the other one looked? I don't know if you can see it here, but this bar is maybe three quarters of an inch, but it's also a torsion style, so it's meant to twist. And then you have different selections on, on the bar to stiffen or soften. And then once again, you can build the links, make them longer. So, and that helps with it unloading and drivability. Awesome. So now with your control arms and that being a four link, so you've got four control arms underneath there, right? Yep. So I noticed some lift kits have just like either the lower or the upper adjustable, or sometimes they're both adjustable. Is there really any difference? Well, it depends on how much lift you're going with. You know, if, once again, if you go back to like a four inch lift on something, the tire with the, like the short arms, comes this way, 
So you want to adjust them back out to get the axle centered back under the Jeep. Also, the pinion angle will change. So you'll have driveline vibes and then like on a TJ, you have to do a SYE to change the driveline angle and everything. And that way you don't have any drive shaft vibes. Okay, and feel that back into the vehicle, right? Make sure yeah. you're not comfortable yeah. ride. Yeah, you notice it right away as soon as you put the lift on. So that's the same front and back that as I lift, the tire, the wheelbase is actually getting shorter. So I've got to recorrect it back out. How does that affect, and I know there's a term for it, but how does that affect my steering in the front? Far as the With once that axle starts moving back in, does it kind of adjust that in any way um, or make it under, worse? Under droop or? Yeah. Well, so, even when you're sitting flat, right? Because I lift it if those tires are yeah. moving closer together. Yeah. So it depends on, once again, the lift kits. So most of them may not address the control arms, but they'll address track bar, drop bracket, and pitman arm. So, and that'll keep your drag link and your track bar parallel, which is key to not have bump steer. You know, say you go over a bridge and your wheel, you know, does that number, and that's bump steer. So that's normally addressed in a lot of companies before the arms. Before the arms, so they take care of that when you order a good quality lift kit. Awesome, and you get a good tech to put it on, right? So you got to make sure you get a good shop to install it for you. Um, and you might have already addressed this because um, I heard you talking about it when I came in. But can you tell us a little bit about caster yes. and how that affects our steering? Yep. So caster is essentially the angle of the seas, and that's going to be making it positive caster. When you lift one, as the axle comes out, most geometry. It actually goes to negative caster, takes caster out of it. So you're steering essentially into the ground from the factory geometry of where they want it. So as you lift it, you want to either make the lower control arms longer or the upper shorter. And that'll tilt the axle back. If you're looking at the side of the C, it'll be standing up like this. You want it to tilt back. And that actually helps with your, your return to center going down the road at high speeds and also helps with drivability. Drivability. Let's go to the front of this one and you can point some of that out for us. We're talking about C's. So on this one, it actually has drop brackets and multiple holes. So if you see how the C is tilted back, this is also a droop, so it does get better as it's on the ground. But these are actually drop brackets for someone that drives on the road mostly. So what that does is, once again, the long arm versus short arm. Well, if you're going to drive it and you're not worried about ground clearance, you see how much you lose from having these. This will actually ride a little better than just putting longer arms on it because it gets the arms flat. Keeps the arms flat so it recorrects that cast. Yes, exactly. So I had it explained to me this way one time. And, and I, you know, it takes me a while to pick stuff up. If you've ever pushed a shopping cart, right, and you notice how the tires are, or the front wheels are kind of tilted backwards. If you start going real fast, the tires start doing all this and they start wiggling around, right? So you want to recorrect that caster for the drivability of the vehicle. Super important. Um, and uh, I actually had someone explain it to me one time that when you're going in reverse, possibly like down backwards down a failed hill, that it makes a big difference too with how much wiggle you get out of the steering wheel because of the way the caster is different. And I always wondered, I said, okay, well, you know, is that something important? Uh, or not? Not really, because you're not going to go backwards down a hill that quick often. So right, you're going to be easy back there. Yeah, the times you're going to be driving forward down the interstate at you know, 70, 80 mile an hour, you know, you definitely want to have better drivability that way. Yeah. So, there is a point of having too much caster though. So, say for instance, a JK, before you even get too much caster in it, you actually get driveline angle vibes. Even though you're not in full drive, the drive shaft still spins. On the JLs, they have to disconnect, so the drive shaft doesn't spin as often. It still has some residual spin, but not full speed, so that helps. And then if you got to an extreme amount of caster, you can get back into death wobble. You actually go around a turn, and it's wanting to go straight so bad with so much caster that you actually get some feedback in the steering wheel where it's trying to correct you. Wow. So kind of when you're turning, you get that. Yep. Wow. Exactly. Now, caster and camber. What's camber? Because I've heard people explain camber the same as caster before, too. So camber is basically straight up and down on this face of the wheel, you know, positive, negative and then positive uh, camber. You know, you, most vehicles are set up different than others, and IFS is going to have a totally different range of 
um, timbre and cap. Timbre is positive and negative, but a Jeep is mostly going to be anywhere from zero to, uh, I think, positive five, or maybe it's negative five, uh, point five degrees. So, and that helps with drivability. Um, a little bit of negative timbre helps, but also you want to keep an eye on the C's on JK's and JL's are easy to bend. So there's where you'll get more cameras. So say you get an alignment done and that they show you that your camera's in the red. Well, there's not really an adjustable part of this other than putting an aftermarket ball joint in there. So that's more or less camera capture. Awesome. And normally you've got to, for camber, caster, um, so in and so out, you've got to have pretty specific equipment to, to kind of test it, right? Yep, and we actually have a foil line machine. Uh, we use it every day. Actually, we do it on every lift kit that we here. Highly recommend the caster correction brackets for arms because most people leave unhappy. Um, and we can actually print out. Everything in the green for them. You know, you have the green and red to make it easy for people to un don't understand the specs. But drivability is a big thing for a lot of people. They'll spend a lot of money. So you go out and buy, you spend the extra money and get a two thousand dollar lift kit with adjustable arms, but you don't put enough caster in it. So you're very disappointed. So you can usually take it to somewhere like this. We're getting instructions from the background. Sorry, <laughs> just miles. Okay. Yeah, we're having some, some audio issues, so picking that up again. So with the specialty equipment, you know, coming in and doing something like that, really you can solve a lot of those issues by having a quality shop install your lift, right? Exactly. And, you know, even if you don't come here, always ask someone for a printout. If you're unhappy, go somewhere else, take your printout with you, and make sure they can discuss with you to make things right. Get them where you want them to be. You know, if you want, you know, if you go somewhere and you know the numbers you're looking at, you can ask them to turn the arms out on the lower control arms, add more casters, and you'll notice a big difference. So now I've had this issue before, and I've heard other people talk about this issue. They go to a shop, they've got a lifted vehicle with 35,000 or 37s on it, and after the tech comes back after doing it, he's like, well, I got it as close as I could. I can't do it with these big tires, right? So is it is that an equipment thing? or? So, yeah, you spend all that money on, a, on an expensive lift kit, then you spend a little bit of money for an alignment, and it's just not quite there. That can get aggravated. Yeah. And the, the caster stuff and all that actually goes for more than just Jeeps. I do uh, F-150, Chevys, Dodges, um, all those. And you can add upper control arms. There's quite a few companies that do that. And that helps with your camber and your caster. So like on your IFS stuff, that actually, when you lift, it messes with camber and caster at once, not just like a Jeep where it has just caster. So that's a big upgrade. And having a shop that knows how to adjust all that is a big thing as well. Yeah, yeah. So well, kind of what we're talking about there is we've been talking all night about a solid axle or a live axle, right? Which is what uh, the Wrangler and the Gladiator are, your large pick of trucks like you're up to 50s, 350s, Ram 2500, 3500s, and I think uh, the Mercedes G Wagon are the only vehicles now you can get with a live axle in the front, right? I believe so. Most people have gone to drivability and more comfort features. So. Yeah, so the independent front suspension that you see on your Toyota Tacomas, Toyota 4Runners, um, and even now some vehicles are IRS independent rear suspension, yeah, right? That's going to be bringing in heavy when you lift the truck. Yeah, I mean, we, we've already done quite a few. The, uh, the G Grand Cherokee, uh, the Liberty and quite a few others, they're actually fully independent cars. And we still do budget boost or small lifts on those, and you have to go and adjust the rear of the suspension. So. Wow. Yeah, so it takes a lot more to change all that. So, awesome. Uh, any other kind of tips and tricks you can, you can share for us as far as kind of choosing the right lift? You know, you walk into a shop, for some of us that don't really know a whole lot, what's, what's kind of what should really be our limiting factor when we look at? Is it money? Is it what we're going to be doing with it? I mean, obviously, if I want to be a uh, an ultra poor racer, I can't do a bunch of food. So, yeah. um, There's no budget there. <laughs> no budget there, right? Yeah. But what kind of should I be looking for? What questions should I be asking? Yeah, so the first thing you should do, obviously, going anywhere, is have a budget in mind. You know, what you're willing to spend. The next thing you need to ask yourself is, what are you going to be doing? Are we just driving this around? Are we hitting some dirt roads every now and then? Or are we just doing it for looks? 
or there's the extreme case of building hardcore off-roading, going to go hit a bunch of rock gardens and all that. Well, you're doing the, the mild wheeling into the hardcore. You definitely want to head towards at least get the half long stops or have those added to them. If you find one you really like, you can always add those to them. So. Yeah, because I do hear every once in a while people piecemeal in there and tie them kids together. Um, you know, they pick their springs from this, they get their control arms from this, and so forth. And there's even, you know, kind of the extreme version where a lot of people build a lot of their own components, like control arms and stuff. I, I do it myself, to be honest. I build custom control arms all the time. And that way you can make core wall tubing. Some live kits, you don't know what, what tubing you're getting when you get these control arms and stuff. And if you're doing hardcore wheeling, you know. And then some have a johnny joint on one end or a bushing on the other, so it depends on, once again, your function, what you're wanting to do. Yeah, we're having audio issues again. I'm getting, I'm getting the peanut gallery in the back here. So, yeah, so really asking those right questions when you go to choose your lift kit, super important. Um, and thankfully, you know, again, hats off to Clemson Pool Drive Center for sharing this information and Cole for giving us the time uh, today. We do have some questions that have come in, and I promised you guys we'd take the time to answer it. So I'm going to ask a question. Uh, we're going to do our best to kind of keep this compressed. Um, so if it turns into too much of a debate, we'll, we'll try to answer it in the comments at a later date um, if we don't get to you right away. So first off, I've got Scott Pope. What happens if you have one side that doesn't let the bump stop and the anti-stop pad on the axle line up? So it sounds like he's having an issue on just one side where you know, that, that bottom pad at the top bump stop just won't line up correctly. It sounds like maybe a control arm issue or something like that. Yeah, you know, it also depends on your configuration. You know, if you're running a bunch of droop out of it and you're running a low lift, you're going to have, if you have a sway bar in the front, it's going to pull to one side. So you will have that problem. Like on the front of this JL, if it had any more, you know, it would try to miss that bump stop pad. Because one way, as it flexes, the axle actually pushes that way, and then when it droops, it pushes the other way. And that's because of the track bar. That, exactly. And that's where people get into the triangulated stuff, so you don't, they have even movement. So. Yeah. But the tra so is the triangulated s stuff, is that something you would typically do, like on a, on a daily driver? Um, or a rock crawler? More towards a rock crawler and all that. The, uh, you know, like a JK or JL is made it hard now because the gas tank down the side. So you have to relocate the gas tank. So it's not as common anymore. But yeah. um, far as the uh, far as the bump stop not lining up though, I mean, basically you just have to look at it and see what's going on here. Yeah, yeah. So maybe if you've got a um, track bar issue. That would be one where I'd say take it to um, a shop and have to kind of take a look at it. If you're down here in Clemson, bring it down here to Cole. Yeah. Um, so that was Scott Pope, uh, Cody Boone. With the electronic disconnect sway bar, is it still better to get out to manually? So is there a difference in flex between the, I've heard yes. Well, it depends on how much travel, once again, you know, what shop makes you're running and all that. And also, if you're hitting a lot of mud and all, eventually you're going to be replacing that anyways. So, if you're wheeling a lot, I wouldn't be surprised if you see a regular sway bar going that deep or, be it, or replace it. But, uh, once again, it depends on length of sway bar lengths and how much group you have. Okay. So... For like a, say I've got a factory Rubicon, excuse me, I probably wouldn't want to change it. But, right. if, but if I'm going to, you know, a, um, an upgraded lift kit, and I really want to get some flex out of it, that's when I probably start looking into that. Yeah, yeah. You know, low lift, you're only going to put so long of a link on it before it starts hitting the frame or hitting the body mount up there. Um, so, awesome. All right, all Jake from State Farm, Jake White. How many pumps per joint to not over grease it? That's actually an excellent question, Jake. Yes. <laughs> You're the technician. I'm just a guy. So here. <laughs> basically, rule of thumb is keep a close eye on a boot, and as you're greasing it, as soon as you see that boot start swelling, I would just go ahead and stop. You have plenty in there to move the boot, and then that's it. And on a Johnny joint, you want to see just barely a little come out of the edge. And most Johnny joints are so tight, you're buying a quality one that it won't fit in there. So it actually, like even a pneumatic one will stop. But the Johnny joint is basically a crossover behind and a OE style uh, flip type bushing.
but it's all like a builder. So there's two parts and there's a ball in there. So it's kind of like a hybrid joint. Right, and you get more flex out of those than yeah. your standard joint. Yes, you get more flex out of them and you don't get as much feedback as a hind. Because you could go full hind, but you know, you're going to get a lot more feedback from that. And it's not a service tool either. You, know, you don't have free supports on those. Oh, okay. Yes, that's a big thing. All right, Justin Miller. I have a ton of slop in the steering wheel, but nothing moves underneath. What could be the cause? Gearbox seems okay. When you say okay, have you looked at the movement going into the box and what's coming out? If you can look at both entry and exit, you want to see it mimic pretty much the same. So you want that to match up pretty well? Yeah, definitely. Awesome, that's actually a good question. Uh, can you go over recommendations for bleeding and changing fluid in power steering gearbox? Also, gearbox bracing for the frame flex. Well, the frame flex, what kind of vehicle are we talking about? That's the biggest thing. That's a big difference. Some of them, you go from one frame rail to the other, it clamps around the, around the box itself. Or like I said earlier, the JLs and the JK, they have one that ties the, the box into the um, track bar over there so it doesn't cross over. Then you have chair keys that have a unibody frame. Just not you. It actually has a plate that you weld in, and then like the old uh, K5 Blazers and the old K truck, K series trucks and square bodies. You actually weld a plate of them. So depends on what you're doing. But the proper procedure for changing the fluid is obviously get all the fluid out, uh, evacuate it out of it, on the line, uh, have it on jack stands, turn it back and forth um, to get it all out. Don't have it running; it'll burn the pump up. And then, when you're ready to go back in with the new fluids, they'll have it on jack stands, fill it up, turn it back and forth quite a few times, look at the actual reservoir itself, so you'll still see air bubbles. And the best scenario for doing this is go and turn the key on, crank it up, and cut it right back off, and go check the fluid, because most of the time they'll suck all that right out, and you don't want the pump to run too long without fluid in it. So, once you get that done, the best thing to do, if your fluid looks good, Take it off the jack stands, let it sit on the ground, and then turn it back and forth while it's running, and then you can increase the RPMs for the pump to run some more. And as you don't see many more bubbles and the fluid level stays the same, and you've got it up to operating temperatures, you're good to go. So with the power steering pump, when I'm turning it, do I want to be kind of just quick back and forth, or do I want to be turning full lock to full lock? Lock to lock, but don't go too fast and skew out. So you're just a casual turn, about like that. You know? Yeah, I can, I can say it's skews out. I've done that a time. Uh, so the key is starting with the tires off the ground and stop yes, the yeah, tires off. Yeah, it makes your life easier to sit there and try to manhandle that thing without it running. So that's one of the main things. And also not stress all that without having to move it. Very cool. Yeah. So um, what about types of power, uh, power steering fluid? I know they're, in the Toyota world, this is a big fatal thing. A lot of the older Toyota Land Cruisers, they um, actually have recommended like an ATF transmission fluid in there. Yeah, so there's a yes and a no to that question. And the best thing I can tell you is go and look at your OE specs, see what that pump was actually recommended for. There are pumps out there that was meant for Dextron or ATF plus four. There's ones that's recommended for just power steering fluid, which there is a difference. And you don't want to mix the two. And then you can go to the aftermarket steering world and they require a certain hydraulic fluid. Yeah, it's a little bit better quality and thicker. That's when you start getting into like hydraulic assist here. Yeah, hydraulic like assist, that. or even just a high flow pump. Some of the high flow pumps recommend a certain fluid. That way it doesn't cavitate and burn the pump up. Yeah, very, very good. For those of you that are still a little younger, right, take care of that power steering pump. Because if you have to drive around without power steering, you're going to have some big forearms. Yeah, it gets rough. All right. Your opinion on options for aftermarket adjustable ball, ball joints? Yeah, so if you're wheeling it, um, honestly, there's quite a few out there now. And budget is going to come to mind. Uh, you can go as extreme as going with like a Dynatrack set. Um, Synergy just came out with a new set that's actually fully rebuildable. Um, I actually talked with the guys out west last year about it when they were debuting it. And, uh, you can press them in, and then once that housing is pressed in and all together, you can take it apart and service each individual part so you don't have to keep pressing it in and out of your seat as you know years go by. They're going to wear. It doesn't matter what you buy. They're going to wear out, especially if you're abusing it every day. I say abusing wheeling hard. 
but uh, Jeep owners never abuse their Jeeps. Yeah, TerraFlex makes a good set. Um, once again, I don't, I don't really know what we're working on. I can assume it's a Jeep. Um, uh, SPC makes stuff for Toyotas. It's good stuff. Um, there's quite a few brands out there for whatever way you're going to go, but I would go with one that's an adjustable. So as you're wheeling, you can tighten them back up because they're going to see a lot of force. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, Matt Tate, proper greasing of RCV axle shafts. Well, once again, application. Uh, a JK, they actually have the stub shaft out there. They have a grease port in the center of the stub shaft. You know, they only have to take the wheel off and grease it. So, I mean, literally just the fitting on your grease gun and you're good to get it. Wow. So, depends on the application. Some of the other ones, you want to yank the boot back. You probably, the best scenario is take the shaft out um, and pull the boot off of it and hand pack it, is what you're just going to have to do. Now, if you have it clicking and popping, um, it's too I've, late then. I've, I've ran on this road, it's just like a CV axle. So, when you do that, it's clicking and popping, you could try to grease it, but I can already tell you you're looking for a rebuild kit. And that's a pretty hard job to rebuild it, right? They're a little aggravated, but not too bad. Once you've done a set, yeah, you, it's yeah, you, you figure the tricks out. So. But you can prevent that with proper maintenance. Yes. All right. Well, what if your camera is one degree off from driver to passenger side? Ooh. Um, that sounds like possibly like the tooth is rotated or? Uh, so we're talking about camera. So once again, application. Uh, if it's IFS, you have adjustability in it. So if it's a Jeep, you can get an adjustable ball joint to a certain degree. Um, past that, if you can't get one up to that to get that whole degree out of it. Um, I know some frame shops, there's no guarantee on this, obviously, but some frame shops will actually heat your seat up and, and chain and pull on it and try to get it back square, but it does fatigue the seat. And if you're doing that, now that's on a solid axle. Um, you do want to go back and some seat gusses, which brings another thing. If you're investing in, in new JK, JLs, TJs, any kind of Jeeps, solid axles, the, the seats are undersized. That's a good upgrade if you want to go ahead and try to put some seat gusses on. Especially once you go up to that bigger tire. Yeah, if you're on the bigger tire, you have more leverage on it, so that could be where he's at right now. You know. Yeah, so having to look at putting those gussets in, um, and those all weld them, right? Yeah, you do have to weld them in. When you weld them in, it keeps the ball joint up, so I highly recommend putting a set of ball joints in while you're doing it. Even if it's new, I've seen quite a few. I don't even, I don't even think we do them that way anymore. We just tell you you have to have ball joints. Cause as you heat that up and weld it in there, it smokes the inside of the ball joint, which has plastic pieces in there. And when it melts, it starts getting play in it and all that. And it's just no fun for anyone. Very cool. All right, so um, hopefully, guys, we've answered all your questions. Um, again, super grateful here uh, Clemson Portal Drive Center to give us this opportunity uh, to take a look at this. Um, all right, so, um, and Again, thank Cole for taking his time, right, after hours, it's, it's time to get home, um, but after hours to kind of carry us around and share his knowledge with us. So make sure you guys show them some love, go to their Facebook page, go to their Instagram page, give them a recommendation, give them a rating, say, hey, thank you guys, um, or if you ever see them on the trail, you know, make sure you give them a handshake after social distancing is away. So um, thank you, Cole. Um, I won't shake your hand, we'll do the elbow shake here, social distance. All right, so weekly prize winner, right? Uh, this part you've been waiting for. I know everybody's hanging around They're like, Mike, please announce who the winner is. We want to know. Where's the free stuff? Where's the free stuff? Jimmy Jenkins, all right? So that's what we came up with. Jimmy Jenkins, you are the winner this week. That name doesn't even sound real, but you are the winner uh, for this week's uh, prize. Uh, don't forget that uh, in order to be eligible for the BFG tires, that in this show, you've got to say, thank you, BFG, down in the comments, right? We're doing something different every, every week in this TechNet series so that you have to watch this whole thing uh, to make sure that uh, you know exactly what to type. So if you go back in and say, I need tires or whatever we said last week in this comments, you don't get entered. It's thank you, BFG, uh, to be entered in this set. Um, and we will draw for those at Dixie Run, uh, which is the next event for Southern Four Drive. Make sure 
that uh, you are signed up to go because it is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, at Winrock Park. Um, you can find more information about it on their Facebook page, uh, Southern Formal Drive Association's Facebook page, as well as www.sfwda.org, I'm not going to mess up this time, .org, uh, to check it out. But they will draw form there. You do not have to be present to win, right? So if you're commenting here, you know you're not going to Dixie Run, but you should be. You don't have to be present to win. All right, guys. So thanks a ton for uh, joining us. Next week, same time, same place, Facebook people, we're going to be doing our next TED Net series. And I do believe Al has a surprise for us for that one as well. Uh, so it proves to be interesting. So thank you guys for joining in. Uh, remember, like, share, tell grandma, grandpa, dad, mom, brother, sister, aunts, uncles, hairdressers to watch this video uh, so that we can get the information out. Go become a member of Southern Portal Drive. Why are you still watching? Go be a member. Now, thank you guys.